So thank you for the introduction. And I will be talking about applying AI in early clinical development of new drugs. So if you're working in pharma or um, clinical trials, um, clinical development, you probably know many of these uh, types of big data. Um, but this is actually not true 10 years ago, if you think about it. Uh, genome sequencing was already available as a technique, but uh, it was still too expensive and not convenient enough to use in clinical trials. But today, actually, we are routinely use genome sequencing of patients in clinical trials to get further insight to find the biomarkers. Single cell sequencing was not even available at that time. And if you look at all other data types, they were either not there at that time or they, the tech, technology was there, but not really widely used. Uh, so that includes, for example, real-world data such as EHRs, insurance claims, um, digital imaging, wearables or sensors, and clinical biomarkers. But today, all of these are available, and so they are actually being powered by deep learning or other AI techniques. So we actually, in clinical development, can do a lot more than we used to be able to. So I want to focus on the early uh, clinical development of new drugs. Uh, and this is where the translational research happens. And by early, I mean the phase one and the phase two uh, clinical trials. This is where you assess the safety and uh, early efficacy proof of concept, whether your drug is really going to work before scaling that up in phase three. So it's a very unique uh, phase where you actually um, test the hypothesis that you develop in the preclinical stage for the first time in the real patients. So the success or failure of this translation really has an outsized uh, impact on the overall success or failure of your drug. And uh, you can also imagine any technology that can improve this success rate will have really, really large impact on drug development. So the natural question is, can AI improve this success, success rate of, uh, of drug development? And uh, we believe, I think you probably all do, the answer is yes. And there are two ways this can happen. So one is impacting the science side of translational research. The other is the operational side. By science, it's mainly impacting finding better biomarkers to develop more precise, precise medicines. Uh, that's really about, is the precision medicine, really what translational research is about. But uh, we don't want to forget the operational side where um, the clinical trials can actually be hugely improved. Uh, as you know, clinical trials are very expensive and very inefficient. Anything we can do to make that more efficient, make the data more reliable, that can improve uh, the translational research tremendously. So we have, have been doing AI for the past several years, and where are we in this journey? And uh, I would like to argue for Roche and for maybe for other pharma as well. We have a past, maybe definitely the first, well, the first stage, demonstrating the value and understanding limitations, um, because in the early stage, we really wanted to know, is AI really going to be able to deliver as, they, as, as people say? And so there are a number of examples I can show there. And the second is once we demonstrate the value, can we explore further opportunities? Can we find um, further potentials to, to really enlarge this impact? And um, I think as someone already alluded to earlier that uh, culture is really a barrier but because in pharmaceutical company, we value molecules. That's what we patent, that's what we develop into clinical stage and market, and, uh, and really, eventually, that's what helps patients. But I think the culture is slowly changing that we want to value data as much as a molecule, because this data can generate insights, can make our molecule better, can make our clinical trials more efficient, and can, can do a lot of uh, innovative things that we haven't thought about before. And the last stage, I think, is uh, we want to operationalize AI, meaning here, I mean, really embed AI in the whole operations, the science operations of, uh, of pharma research and development, and we are not there yet. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to just go through this and then provide some examples for each of the categories. 
And in my first example, so I want to talk about uh, using deep learning uh, in neurological diseases. So this is our, one of our early success stories in demonstrating the power of deep learning. This is what happened, I think, maybe four years ago, started. Um, and as you know, um, Parkinson's disease, this is a disease really affects celebrities, but can affect any of us sitting here. Uh, unfortunately, the, the way to uh, diagnose and to monitor patient symptoms if you are in a clinical trial, it's very um, old and crude method. Uh, this is the UPDRS testing. Basically, you go to the doctor's office, there are a series of tests, uh, behavioral tests or movement tests that, that you go through. So there are two problems with this. One is uh, it could be very subjective, you know, because a different physician may come, come up with a different answer. Could be affected by the patient's you know, mood that day or something else that day. And second is that we don't really know uh, what happens be between the each, uh, each visit to the clinic. So in the bottom right, I think, panel here, it's a representation of patient journey in a whole year. So 365 dots there, each represent one day. And uh, you could see here are the two visits basically in this this is a phase one trial that we ran for about a year. And that's you, um, you have two visits. And um, the problem is that the symptoms really, the, these, the, 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 the red dots represent the severity of the symptoms of the patient over a year. But you really, the, the patient can really only recall about maybe a few days, a week of what happens in, in between the, the two visits. So when the doctor asks what, how was, uh, how was your symptom since the last visit? You don't really remember what happens two weeks, three weeks, two months, three months uh, you know, back. And, and so that is, you, you're missing a lot of information. And second, as I mentioned, it's really not that accurate because there is no molecular biomarker that you can use. So if you look at typical curve, actually, this is a maybe ideal situation that you could see difference between placebo and the drug. But in reality, you may see a very large error bar and you actually also don't know what's happening in between. So that doesn't help us in understanding how the drug is really doing. And uh, so the question is, can we use any digital technology here? Uh, we call that digital biomarker, basically using the sensor signal from the, the, the smartphones to answer that kind of question. So we devised two type of uh, uh, test, one's called the active test, which mimics the UPDRS testing. And uh, so, for example, the patient will walk, will do balance, will do uh, rest and tremor, those things are being measured. And the second part of the test is the passive monitoring, where a patient just puts the cell phone in their pockets and wear that uh, uh, with them during the day. Um, and we stream the data and collect the data and then see what we can learn from that. So this is what uh, the data would look like. Um, the cell phone actually generates a lot of data continuously, and that's uh, both the gyration and uh, acceleration in three dimensions. And this is actually one of our colleagues in Basel, Switzerland, and he didn't know he was gonna be filmed uh, when he was <laughs> on that day when he was wearing shorts. Um, and uh, this is uh, actually the deep learning model our colleague we in, in our New York site developed. So he took uh, um, a deep learning model from, from the public and he actually adapted that to the sensor data in our clinical trials. And he used actually a, a 50 hours of public sensor data to train his model. And, um, uh, and, and so in the validation, the held out test, he achieved very high accuracy, 99%, 98% accuracy. And when this is applied to our patients, so we were using the active test as uh, the, the validation says, because in the active test, we actually know whether the patient is sitting, is, it, is the patient is, uh, is moving. Uh, so be, actually between standing and walking, we were able to achieve you know, 99 or 96% accuracy. And uh, in reality, we also uh, you know, are predicting multi-classes. Uh, you know, is it trying, patient lying, is standing, is sitting, is walking stairs, etc. And uh, so this is uh, some preliminary results in the phase one trial. So as you see that indeed, 
uh, you could see the difference purely based on the, the phone data, not based on any physician assessment to tell the difference between healthy volunteers and, and the Parkinson's disease patients. So both in, you know that the patients uh, spend less time walking and when they do, uh, do stand, they actually have a less stand sit uh, transitions. And they also invest less power in their turns. So these are things that you can, you can actually gain from your, uh, your model. And uh, so, and, and the patients, you could see that also patients invest, they, they walk less, they, they uh, invest less power in the walking and they walk slower. So these are things that was in our first example, but we were now in the phase to expand that in many, many different neurological diseases. One example is uh, schizophrenia. Uh, he used the same model, trained on different uh, data. So this is an actigraphy watch with the watch data and then similarly achieved a very high accuracy. See, this is the correlation between predicted and the actual uh, results. And uh, to make a long story short, you could also see correlations between uh, the activity ratio <clears throat> and uh, basically this is a measure of how motivated the patients are in their life and also some negative symptoms such as a diminished expression. So the patients who are more active in their gesture, in their, the power of their gesture, they actually are doing better in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of their, their uh, clinical symptoms. And this, as you can imagine, can eventually become a more objective way of measuring patients in clinic and in, uh, in, in many ways in helping our de uh, drug development. So moving on to another uh, disease area and the different data type. So you, you saw the digital biomarkers. We could also ask, can AI be used in traditional molecular biomarkers? For example, in, in oncology. In oncology, we have abundance of molecular biomarkers candidates, usually hundreds, if not thousands in clinical trial, phase one, phase two, but the validating markers are still very rare and especially in immunotherapy, where you don't know the mechanism of action that well. So uh, this is uh, Francesca in, in our New York team also did. She actually took all the baseline lab readouts. Uh, that includes both the immune biomarkers and also the chemistry biomarkers. And uh, using the gradient boosting model and, and then try to see which of the features uh, are possible biomarker that can predict patient response. For example, complete response, partial response, stable disease, or progressive disease. And here we are, since we actually didn't have that many patients, we couldn't really build a predictive model, but we used the machine learning approach to, to rank the features based on their importance. And here you can see there are just two examples of the features that, uh, that uh, one marker is actually immune marker, the other is actually a chemistry marker. Actually, each one of them have some predictive power, but by combining them, actually you could see that these are the ones that patients that are responding, and these are the patients that don't respond. So by, by having two biomarkers, you actually can have much better prediction. So you could also ask, are they really just some random um, feature that you select? So we actually use our real world data, the electronic health record from flat, flat iron that we use to see can we validate some of these. So this is a result of one, one of the lab chemistry marker that we could actually see that uh, uh, patients with a lower, so this chemistry marker activity have higher survival uh, chance. And this we actually find in quite a few of the markers that we found. Basically, patients who, who are healthier uh, in various ways, they actually do better. Not only in their, they live longer, they actually respond to the drug better. And these are actually could be very useful in, in predicting which patient might respond to certain drugs. And uh, I mentioned operation size. Aside of the translational research, I won't go into too much detail here. But um, we are. But you, I think the, the key point here is that uh, if, if we look at one example, patient recruitment, this is really the most expensive part of running clinical trials, more than 30% of total cost. And, uh, but it's very inefficient because uh, less than 10% of patients actually you see really complete clinical trials. There are multiple 
points where patients are either disqualified, drop out, or just, just leave the clinical trials. So as you can imagine, if we can improve the patient recruitment, having, have the right patients at the right clinical sites, then our data can become a lot more reliable. Our science can become also much better. And uh, we actually explore the real world data to, uh, to improve patient recruitment. That actually worked. And uh, I won't, uh, my time is up. So I, and we actually also looking at, uh, can we use AI to actually uh, help us do more predict, uh, much better prediction. So I'm going through the next few slides very quickly. I, I mentioned uh, culture here. Uh, as you know, that in, in pharma, we want to introduce this data culture. And one of the things that was done was uh, introducing the data challenges or hackathons that are very, very prevalent in machine learning community, but not so much of a practice in pharma. And so this is the first uh, red challenge or the uh, Roche analytic, uh, advanced analytic data challenge. We use flat iron data with the goal of predicting patient survival after one year of treatment. And just, just, I just want to point to really 500 people from 28 Roche sites uh, attended this with 132 teams, really great participation. And uh, this is another example that we actually, our HR is also thinking about how to recruit um, the new kinds of talent. So they put the code for life challenge for the community and also this type of thing that could, could be used in recruitment of uh, talent. Um, this is, uh, I think, my last. And uh, basically, I think we are still not there in operationalizing AI. And uh, um, there are two major things. One is uh, we still lack data. We still lack well-labeled, well-curated data. And second is we don't even have the infrastructure to really make data fair. So that we, by that we mean, can data be findable, be accessible, interoperable, or reusable? Without that, it's actually very difficult to, to do large scale AI. So that's, that's my end. And uh, I think I have um, demonstrated there's a tremendous potential and also we are exploring different opportunities. Uh, and I hope that a new culture is taking shape and that there's a lot of work that we still need to do in operationalizing AI. And I will stop here. And uh, while you're thinking of questions, I just want to acknowledge quite a few people there. Uh,